Hello, welcome to the Can't Be Podcast. We're still in an international break, but we are coming to the end of that now. Villa in Premier League action this Sunday against West Ham. Uh, we're here for our weekly Monday show, but because there's nothing fresh to talk about, we thought we'd do a QA. and a Welcome Dan Bardell back to the show, his favourite podcast. Dan, how are you? I love being always a pleasure to talk to you, converse with you. Roller, happy to happy happy to help as I always say to you. <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, your your social reach is much appreciated. Uh, <laughs> we're gonna do <laughs> we're gonna do a cough's not appreciated. No, definitely not. We're gonna do a Q and A Q&A this afternoon or this morning, whenever this is going out. I've got fans' questions from social media across a wide range of topics, and we'll dive straight into it. Uh, Sean says, discuss. Villa have had a great start to the season and a lot of our players haven't reached full flow yet, i.e. Zaniolo, Pau Torres, Diaby all have levels they can go up to. And with Moreno and Ramsey still to come back, how exciting is it to be a Villa fan right now? Yeah, I think we've had a, a brilliant start to the season. To to be sat in fifth you know, with the injuries that you've mentioned, with having to bed players in, because Pau Torres has had to come straight in and be bedded in a lot quick, quicker and probably in a different position than I, than I think he would have been. Ramsey's been out, Moreno's been out. They've been a huge, but they were a huge part of the, the left-hand side last season that was so successful. And then you take Mings out of there at left centre back as well. So there's had to be a lot of adaptation, probably from Emery, from the from the players. They've probably had to change the way they actually wanted to do things. I think they've recovered from setbacks well. In general, when they've lost games, they always seem to have have recovered. And I think this spell of fixtures that they're on now. 10 points from 12 is a really good return. And to be fifth in the October international break and feel like we haven't reached our full potential, I think that can obviously only be encouraging. I asked John in last week's show to like rate the Premier League, rate the Carabao Cup, rate the European com- the campaign, or rate the season as a whole. If I asked you to do the same, just rate the season as a whole, not the specific competitions, what would you give it out of 10? Uh, probably a 7.5, nearer an 8 than a 7. I think the Carabao Cup is, obviously we win the next game 6-1, so you kind of forget about it, but we know that we've got a cup specialist manager, so you kind of get in your head, we might win something this year, and then straight away you're knocked out of one of the cups that you think you might you might be able to win, and you see some of the teams that got knocked out as well. Mm. It was disappointing, but he, I understand that he ha- he feels he has to play fringe players and ha- has to make changes for for those types of games, and he he did it. It didn't work on that occasion. I think we caught Everton at a, a bad time. They went pretty much full tilt. They they'd been rotten up until that up until that point, but they won the weekend before they played us. And in fairness, they've won a couple of games since then as well. So I think the timing of playing Everton wasn't brilliant. It's disappointing. I understand why you did it, but ultimately, I, I want to see us win a trophy this season. I'm desperate for us to, for us to win something, and that's an avenue that's disappeared. Premier League sitting in fifth probably shouldn't be a massive surprise in a lot of ways because if you look at the league table over the last 30 games since Emery arrived at the club, and I think that's 2023 in general, it's 30 games, we're second or third in, the, in, third in that table. So for us to be fifth isn't a huge, huge shock, isn't, isn't a huge surprise, but I think you know we've ticked off a lot of difficult away games that they, they've been done and we're just on a nice little run at the moment with nice fixtures coming up where I would... You know, I'll go into those games thinking we've got a chance of winning. I'd back us to beat anyone at Villa Park yeah, at the, the moment. So maybe 7.5 is a little bit harsh, but I think I just I have to give it that because of the, the Carabao Cup exit. Europe, we lost the first game, won the second one, so we're, we're about even. I still think we'll progress mm-hmm. through, through that group. I think the injuries, maybe the injuries should make the, make the score higher, but I think it probably brings down the feeling around the club a little bit yeah. because, you know, Ty- Tyra Mings at the start of the season, that's a, that's a disaster when there at the start of the season, that's probably not to the same extent, but that's a disaster as, as as well. And then Ramsey comes back and you start to think, right, here he is. And Moreno had us, he was back on the bench and then he's gone again. So, yeah. you know, actually maybe the rating should be higher because to be where we are, considering what's happened at the start of this season, again, just shows what a class act this manager is. Just as a bit of a side note, I was reading something last week about the, the coefficients for fifth place in the Champions League and we kind of suspect that that will be a Champions League spot because yeah, England be. performed so well in Europe. But it's based on this season, apparently. It's not past years gone by. So English clubs in Europe this season have to do well for England's coefficient to get fifth place. So like Man United if they went out of the Champions League group stage, they lost the first two games, didn't they? For Villa, yeah. if they finished fifth, that's a bad thing because as much as I love seeing Man United lose matches, we need the English sides in European competitions this season to do well and reach the latter stages of com- various competitions to make fifth place be Champions League football, just in case Villa do do that. 
I think the other three, to, like Manchester United have given themselves a, a massive, massive mm. journey now to try and get out of that group. But, but even if they were to finish third, you know, they'd drop down to the Europa League and probably have a decent chance of, yeah. of winning that. Oh, I think yeah. Newcastle yeah. beat PSG uh, very comfortably last week. Arsenal look a bit more assured this season. Look like they've got a bit more resilience about them. You'd back them to go pretty deep. Mm. In the knockouts and Man City, uh, uh, Man City, I would still probably just about make them favourites for the for the Champions League this this season. Although I do think the the teams have brought in Bayern have obviously improved. We're getting in Har- Harry Kane. Real Madrid have got have got. I think Barca are better this season. They've got a good team. I think Real Madrid. Obviously, they've got Bellingham, and everyone makes the noise about him, and he's mm. a stupendous player. Like he's absolutely ridiculous. Jude Bellingham. They don't have that goal scorer that I think they might need when it goes a little bit deeper. So I would still make an English. I'd still back an English team to win the Champions League, potentially win the Europa League and the Conference League. Matt Jilks says, "Are we starting to see the best of Matty Cash? If I'm not mistaken, he was injured when Unai Emery arrived and then went out to Qatar for the World Cup. So didn't have the time of, that the rest of the squad had with learning a new style of play." Uh, which, yeah, he did have an injury, didn't he, around the time Emery yeah. came in or, or just after. We are seeing the best of cash now and I still think he will have a, another couple of levels he could go up as well. He's a really clever footballer. <clears throat> Mike, I'm sorry, I'm throat. Do you need a, do you need a little drink or something? I've just had one, but it's still, still <laughs> lurking around. I, until I came on this podcast, I was absolutely fine and I've come on here to talk to you <laughs> and something, something's happened to me. Something's occurred. Nervous. Matty Cash, is a, he's a really good nervous. He's a really, <laughs> really good, good footballer. I think he can play multiple positions. I actually think he's really dangerous in that right wing spot, especially mm. in a in, in away games. I think he's useful there. He's actually sometimes you'd play Bailey there, for example. Matty Cash is arguably more of a goal threat. I don't know whether that says a lot about Leon Bailey or whether it says more about Matty Cash. But you know what I mean? Like he wants to pop up and yeah, look dangerous, and he's actually a, he's a decent finisher as mm. well, Matty Cash. And he he used to be a winger as well, and I quite liked Carlos being at centre back with Paul Torres and Concer behind him at right back. I quite like the extra solidarity that that brings but I think he's an adaptable player as well and Emery will Emery will like that a multifunctional player but he mm. didn't adapt quickly to what Emery Emery wanted I remember certain games Emery was going absolutely ballistic at Matty Cash on the sideline Ashley Young played games over him at times but he's come back this season and just looks like he's, re- he's really up for it looks like he's getting to grips with what Emery wants I mean you guys interviewed him as well he speaks very highly of, mm. of Emery understands that maybe he didn't get it when he when he first came in, and I don't think he was alone in that. I think there was a there was a few players who didn't quite grasp what Emery wanted. Even Emmy Martinez, there was a stat yesterday on Scorqua saying the most uh, sweeper keeper actions in the in Europe so far this season has been Emmy Martinez. He was struggling with that that side of the game a little bit mm. in his distribution yeah, yeah. under Emery at first, and Emmy Martinez, is, I think, is the best goalkeeper in the world. So players adapt at different times. Matty Cash wasn't alone, but I think he's really taken on board what Emery wants. And I think what's quite interesting about Villa this season, last season there was all where the right back would always tuck in. Mm. If it's not Conte playing there, and it, when he's been Cash and Luca Dean by and large this season, Cash is getting forward more. Luca Dean's getting forward a lot as well. It's almost like because they've had more time to get over Emery's methods, Emery doesn't feel that like we need that extra security. So both mm-hmm. wing, both fullbacks can operate and bomb on and get high at the pitch. And, and that's what's happened this season. So I think maybe some of Matty Cash's improvement this season is the way Villa have lined up and what Emery wants his right back to do is different to what he wanted mm-hmm. his right back to do last season. I think that suits Cash's game more. You mentioned Bailey, Bailey early on as well. Uh, question from Field83. Leon Bailey's contract is set to expire in 2025. Will he be offered a new contract? Has he done enough to be offered a new one? Or will Villa look to sell in the summer to help balance FFP over the next three years? Again, had a productive start to the season. His durability is a problem. It feels like he gets little knocks mm. all the time. Same problem with Bailey, I think. I think if he starts a game well, at home in particular, he'll go yeah. on and have a good game and probably get a goal or a, or an assist. If he starts badly, he seems to go into his shell a bit. I think he's definitely more a Villa Park player. Away, away from home, I don't think he always puts in great performances. I think maybe when games get a bit physical, sometimes he's not, he's, he's not quite there. Two years left on his contract. There was murmurs of a new contract last season and that obviously hasn't, hasn't happened. It's a difficult one with him because you want to protect a player's value. Mm. But at the moment, I don't think Villa are getting anywhere near back what they paid for him, whether he gets a new contract or or whether he doesn't. So almost from FFP terms, it, it's almost irrelevant in, in some ways because Villa will be making a loss 
yeah. on that player. I think Emery clearly likes him because more often than not, he's in the team. Leon Bailey, he's, he's, he's picked most of the time. It would have been interesting if we'd had everyone fit all season, how much football he, he would have got. But we saw in the Palace game, he came on and made an impact, came on and, yep. and, and scored a goal. If, if he's a bench player, he's an interesting bench player to have and bring on. And you might see him influence games in a similar way. There was that spell last season where Troy Allray did. I think we're a better side now. So I think Bailey is better than Troy Allray. I think bringing him off the bench shows that the club is, is stronger because Bailey played, by and large, started games like last season it's a, it's a difficult one I, I don't know where he where he stands really it would you'd probably get to the summer and look at what kind of business we were planning on doing and if we're looking to sign another another wide player he'd probably go yeah but, but where i guess saudi arabia has opened up a different market where from a player's perspective he could probably go there and make a lot of money because he is a relatively big name player and also from villa's perspective there they'd probably get a decent fee. So if I was to predict what would happen, I'd predict that in a year's time, Villa are maybe looking for a more consistent winger mm. and that he'd probably go to Saudi Arabia. That would be my thinking. Yeah, consistency is his downfall, isn't it? And his injury record. Same with a lot fit. of wide players, though, isn't yeah. it? We yeah. bought DRB. He's just a completely different level of player. He's adapted to the Premier League straight yeah. away. That second striker role seems to suit him down to the ground. He can drift around and get in behind or pull wide if he needs to. And he seems to have created a good link up with, with, with Watkins. They seem to know each other's games quite well because by the nature of Bailey's injuries at the time he's been at Villa. And I do think he has lost a yard of pace in his time at Villa. You think of that yeah. Everton game when he came on and he scored that rasping goal. Think how quick he felt in that game. I've never felt like he's had that level of pace again. Yeah. Ever since, and that's if that if that's the case, that's that's unfortunate because you know injuries have, have have played a part in that. And his first season here, he was injured pretty much the entirety of the season. Every time he came back, he broke down again. So you don't know whether that's had a had a lasting effect on his body physically. You don't know whether mentally that's played 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 a part, but played a toll on on him as well. So you have to take all these things into in, into account. He hasn't been as good as I perhaps thought he would be. I was really excited mm. about that signing when we signed him. But I don't think he's been a flop by, by any stretch of the imagination at all. No, just not got what we expected for thirty odd million pounds. Although I would say he's been better this season than spells he had last. It's interesting you say about him being better at home. I don't have the stats in front of me, but I've seen them way before, better. and he's way better at home than he is away. Just as a, a totally hypothetical point, if he was around in the season where we played a year behind closed doors, I think he'd be a, a great player in those circumstances where there's no Reckon. pressure of a crowd. I think yeah, so. maybe, yeah, possibly. Well, we'll never know, will we? No, we'll like I said, hypothetical. Know. But uh, yeah. yeah, we move on. Let's go with another Matt. Uh, looking at the current injury situation, who comes straight back in and what does a first 11 look like from a fully fit squad? Now, already that's a very difficult question. He again goes on to say, should Concer or Pau Torres be dropped for Mings? Is Moreno a certain step up given age and length of time out? Where does Buendia fit in? We've seen JJ's a must. Uh, there's a lot of questions there and there's a lot of players injured, of course. Uh, I don't like the idea of just like, oh, Mings is fit now, in you come, because uh, Pau Torres, Conson and Carlos, to an extent, will have played pretty much a full season without him and, and rightfully it earned their place and kept it. But Villa will look a much stronger place when those four players come back. Can you pick a strongest 11 out of everyone available? That's tough, I think. I don't think there's such a thing as your strongest 11. I think most teams have a eight or, well, most good teams will have an eight or a nine that are, set in stone pretty much and then the rest will rotate. I think you very much say that with Man City like last season when yeah. they had their season the core of the team stayed the same it was probably the right winger mm. changed and he might change one of his one of his defenders but that core of the team was there and I think that would have been what 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 Villa had done really I think Ramsey is 100% in the best 11 like no no doubt about that when everyone's fit Ramsey has that left hand side spot Mm -hmm. or, or, in my opinion, Villa's best eleven. I don't. I don't actually think the front six and the goalkeeper changes in Villa's mm -hmm. best eleven. I think it's the mid. It's the McGinn, Louise, Kamara, and um, Ramsey yeah. is the midfield. Yeah. Watkins and Diaby up top. Martinez in goal. Yeah. They're bankers. I think concert plays somewhere, whether it be right back or, or centre back. But I do think it would have been the defence that would have would have changed. I think at the start of the season, because Moreno was out, Pau Torres would have played left back. I don't think Luca Dane would have been playing as much football. That was the plan. It was clear that was going to be the plan, that Pau Torres was going to play left back. We did it in pre-season. Mings and mm. Concert, Cash, 
sometimes Carlos might have played and Constant might have been right back. We might have played with four centre backs like Man City mm. do in yeah. some games. I genuinely believe that would happen. So, like I said, the front six and the goalkeeper are set in stone. I think it would have been the rest of it that that would have changed. I actually think you know some games you might have seen Moreno at left back and you wanted Moreno to bomb on Concer at right back, and then maybe Carlos and, and Pau Torres. I do think there's a world as well where Mings would play left centre back and Pau Torres would have played right centre back and kind of it's not something that's happened in football yet. But like, a, I think Wolves do it actually with Max Kilman, like an an inverted centre back, like cutting <laughs> in. I know it sounds stupid, but who would have been thought would have been talking about inverted fullbacks True. The, years ago? It wouldn't have been a thing. Like, I actually think we might have tried that. So I think the makeup of the defence would have changed quite a lot depending on the opponents. But the front six when everyone's fit, and of course. There'd have been games when McGinn was on the bench for Zaniolo and there'd mm. have been games when Ramsey wouldn't have played, perhaps Tillemans coming in for, for certain games and that, that will still be the case. But I think Villa's best 11, that front six doesn't change, goalkeeper doesn't change. It would have been the back four that we saw that changed depending on what the game plan was because we know Emery has different game plans for different games. I think that's spot on as well. There was a, another question about Jacob Ramsey. We've answered it uh, from Dr. AVFC. When, when Ramsey's fit, is he starting? And if so, where? Yeah. Yes, Lefty. definitely. Just as a, a follow-up to that, and I'll tweet the question. Do you think Ramsey could play that second striker role? It's a good I think finisher, he could. Good running with the ball. I wouldn't have him with Watkins, I don't think. Why? I don't think. I just don't know. I feel like they'd kind of want to do the kind of the same things, maybe. I might be completely wrong here. I think if Watkins didn't play, you could play Ramsey in, in Watkins' role, in my, in my opinion. I don't think he'll ever play there for us, though. I think he no, could probably. play there, but I don't. I don't think he ever will. I think his position is left hand side. That's the mm. that's position uh, Emery has now down for him. I don't think he's like McGinn, where you might see him play central mid, you might see him play right, you might see him play left, you might see him up top. I think McGinn's ahead of him to play up top, and we've seen McGinn mm. playing up yeah. top or in the game. We've changed to have McGinn, McGinn up top. I, I don't think. I think Ramsey could play there in a, in a fashion, but I think his best position, and he's so crucial to the team, playing in that left-hand side role. So I don't think it would be something that we'll, that we'll ever see because you've got you've got Watkins and Diaby and I think you've got McGinn and Zaniola and Bailey who would play there mm. ahead of him. So I don't think you'd ever see it. There's no, there wouldn't be a need for it. From Villa Lytics, realistically, with a fully fit squad, which positions still need to be strengthened either the starting at 11 or the bench for Villa to legitimately push for a top four place? Oh, I see. I think we can push for a top four place now. I'm not saying we're going to get it, but I think the squad is there and you have to be careful with transfers, with doing too much upheaval. We actually ended up doing more business in the summer than I thought we would, but part of that was because of injuries. Obviously, Longley had to come in to to cover Mings and Mm. Zaniola, I think, was coming in anyway, but he was essentially Coutinho's replacement and then Buendia got injured. You have to be careful that you don't do too much and you don't change too much too soon. I think at some point you will see another right back come in because Matty Cash is the only auxiliary natural right back that's there at the moment I still think if you want to rotate and make changes in cups we need a better second goalkeeper if you if you're going to change that I don't want to be harsh and I know he gets absolutely hammered and I don't like to get personal with people too much but you know every time he plays in the cup we get knocked out that's what it feels yeah. like to me. That anyway, yeah, that, and that and that is what's happened. So I think to push on, and if you don't want to play Martinez every game for whatever reason, I don't even think your keeper does need rotating. But I'm not a football manager. Then we would need a better second goalkeeper. I like the way the squad is set. If everyone's fit, I think that's a strong squad that's capable of pushing um, towards the towards the top four. It, when we get into a year's time, it, it'll be depending on where we finish this season. It will be really interesting to see. Where where we go? Maybe another, maybe you'd like a couple of players, maybe a couple more of players that can play dual roles. So maybe mm. you know you sell Bailey, and I think depth wise, when everyone's fit, we're okay for numbers. Numbers, I think we're okay. But maybe in twelve months' time, let's say Bailey was to go, and you buy someone who can play wide or up top, mm. it's a better quality of player. That that that's how you become. A, a better side, maybe another, maybe Den Donker leaves, for example, and the central midfielder comes in who can play wide as well, or perhaps play play fullback. So we were linked with Tyler Adams, for example, in the summer. So I know he's gone to Bournemouth, but maybe if Den Donker had gone, Tyler Adams had replaced him, and then he can also play as an inverted fullback. I think mm. that's how we become better now. We sign players that can play in, in, in different positions who are a better quality of the players who aren't in the first 11 now, but 
all I like I say, all in when everyone's fit, I think that's a, a good squad that's capable of finishing in the top five, six, especially when you look at how Manchester United and Chelsea are this this season. I still I still think Villa will finish. I'm not sure they will over Manchester United because I, I think they might get it together. I still think Villa will finish ahead of Chelsea this season. And possibly even Newcastle. I think they finish, I think Villa finish ahead of Brighton. So I think they do think the sky is the limit. I think the only teams categorically I'd say at the moment Villa won't finish ahead of are Man City, Arsenal and Liverpool. Yeah. Other than that, I've not. Oh. Spurs, it's difficult to judge at the moment. They've obviously got off to a to a to a brilliant start. I'd maybe put Villa I'd put Villa and Spurs at a similar level of side, mm. in all honesty, and there isn't much in it points wise at that at, at the moment. They've had some tough games as well, actually, Spurs, but you know, I'd put Villa Villa could easily finish fifth this season and could easily finish fourth, in my opinion. Yeah, I totally agree. I said fourth in the summer before I realised that fifth could get Champions League, so I'd be more than happy to finish fifth. And I think Villa will. I think Villa will will finish fifth. I think we'll be. I think Chelsea will be lucky to get in the top eight. To be honest, with what we've they seen picked up the in recent weeks. But I watched the first half of their game against Burnley, and they were fortunate. They scored a fortunate yeah. goal, and then Burnley collapsed. But I still think Villa uh, Villa have got a, a better side than Chelsea. Maybe in a few years' time, that Chelsea side grows with all the young players, and yeah, they, yeah, they get yeah, of better. Course. But I still think Villa are a, a better team than Chelsea and have better options. You yeah. know, people say about Villa could upgrade Ollie Watkins. If Chelsea had Ollie Watkins, they'd be higher in the league. Yeah, exactly that. Uh, we had a question about Watkins from Ricardo. He said, which Man United and Chelsea players should Ollie Watkins be tapping up for Villa on international duty? On Saturday, I watched the first half of the chelsea Burnley game and then the second half I watched Man U v Brentford. Mm. And I watched both of them and just thought, do really want anyone? Not really that bothered. Yeah. Do any of their players come in and dramatically improve Villa at the moment? Bruno Fernandes probably gets in Villa's team. I'm not being, not being stupid. I don't there. want him though. But I like the way I, I like our players. I think mm. our players are perfect for what Emery wants, and they've shown that in the time he's been at the been at the club. I just watch them and think Villa are a better team than than both of them. They play better football. They're more yeah. organised. Villa is a club aren't a basket case club like those two are. Like if I'm a Premier League footballer at the moment, obviously Manchester United and Chelsea have got incredible finances and incredible pool. But if you were to just make a purely football decision, you'd probably rather go to Villa. And people say I'm biased because I'm a Villa fan, but Villa are just a more stable club that are clearly going in the right direction. Yeah. Anything could happen with those two clubs, literally anything. And play we you know, we've used to say over the years, Villa's a graveyard for a graveyard for players. Manchester United's a graveyard for players mm -hmm. over the yeah, last yeah. 10 years. Players have gone there and done nothing. So if you're a Premier League player who wants to play in the Premier League, I think Villa are a very, very attractive proposition. And, but uh, to answer the original point, I'm not sure we necessarily need anyone from Chelsea or Manchester United, <laughs> which is mad. There's a, another hypothetical one from Paul relating to Watkins. It literally, it's five words. Hypothetically, Ivan Tony or Watkins. Uh, you can take that in however you, however you want. Would you rather sign one or the other, I suppose? Would you rather play Watkins for me? I think Ivan Tony is a very, very good player. So I really, really, but I we really, know that really Ollie Watkins, If we're talking yeah. about a hypothetical scenario, we know Ollie Watkins works at Aston Villa. We don't know that Ivan Tony works outside of Brentford just yet. No. Uh, I, I, I assume mean, he would, but for now, yeah. I'd say Watkins. We're talking about like England, for example. Now, I think <laughs> Ivan Tony. If, if, if again, if everyone's fit, I probably pick Tony as the second striker for England because I think mm. he does more of the things that Kane does. Mm. He's a more similar player. Watkins is a very different player to Kane. If you want to play in the same way, I think Tony's the, ne the next striker. But there's this weird dialogue on social media after certain games, and it died down a little bit since the Brighton game. Villa can do better than Ollie Watkins. We need to get a better striker in. There isn't one. I don't care what anyone says. Like I said on Twitter, there's a couple of hills I'll die on. And one of them is that Villa cannot, for the position we're in at the moment, there is no better striker out there than Ollie Watkins that is gettable for Villa. Yeah. And there's no better striker for Villa that suits the manager and the way the manager sets his team up to play and what his manager wants his centre forward to do. I think Unai Emery wouldn't change Ollie Watkins. I think if he wanted to, he could, could have done it in the summer. We could have yeah. sold Watkins because he's got two years left on his contract. And to go and get a striker is not easy. Mm. Chelsea striker. And again, Chelsea are a good big draw to players and always will be. Same with Manchester United. They're signing Hoyland and Nicholas Jackson, who are not surefire things. Look at Watkins' productivity under Emery in goals and assists. Yeah. His record is ridiculous. If there was another player like that in the Premier League playing for someone else, we'd be saying, oh, we need a striker like that. I wish we could get someone exactly, like that. Yeah. Because he's at us, he almost goes under underappreciated. 
I'm categorically saying, and I fully believe this wholeheartedly, I'm not even going to say that I might be wrong in this because I genuinely feel that strongly about it. There is no better striker for Villa to have. We've spoken about this before, but you won't have watched it. We've spoken about how, because you won't, because we watch him every single week, we see all of his misses and the miscontrols and whatever else, whereas you don't watch every single minute of every other player. You'll see it on the highlights, or you watch the odd mm. game of X forward, but because you see Watkins every single week, we're extra critical of him. As you said, if he was doing what he does for Villa for somebody else, if he was doing it for Brighton and you only saw the flashy bits on match of the day, you'd be going, oh, I wish we had him. Because I think that fans see up Watkins every week and miss two chances and then score the last one. They go, oh, we can do better than that. But I wholeheartedly agree with you and have said before, I don't think there's anyone I would swap him for because we know he works in this system and that's massive in football. If it so works and suits it's- a manager, that's huge. I was saying this a year ago when he wasn't scoring under Gerrard. I was saying there isn't a better striker there. We're just why we're playing is no good. Like, but mm. I remember when Ings was sold, there was a lot of people saying, "Oh, we sold the wrong striker. Ings should be playing." <laughs> yeah. Ings didn't have the attributes to play as a as a lone forward. Ollie Watkins has mm. all the attributes to play as a lone forward. And what I like about him is he always improves. Like, he wasn't getting assists eighteen yeah. months ago. He's getting a ton of assists. Under him, now that ball he clicked in for Paul Torres at the weekend was a, a lovely ball, a, like a, Very good. A, stri- a striker dream. And people will remember his missed chance at the end. And I, I think yes, I think he should have scored. But Haaland misses chances. Yeah. If you if you look at the rest of the Premier League now, Ollie Watkins, I think, probably gets into every team except for Man City and probably Liverpool. And even then, I think he might get in the Liverpool team, but they like to play with a Gakpo or a Jota, who's a mm. different type of player as a as a number nine. Their goal scorer is their right midfielder in Salah. Tottenham would probably have him. I think Manchester United would... Hoyland's going to be a good player, I think. But at the moment, who's going to score you more goals in the Premier League? Probably Oli Watkins. Arsenal are playing with Eddie Nketiah at front at the moment. Now, I think Oli Watkins is an infinitely better striker than Eddie Nketiah. So yep. this is a player that gets into nearly every time. I mean, he, I like Isak at Newcastle. And again, I think he, hmm. him and Wilson, yeah. what the thing they've got going on there with the rotation is good. I like, I like, I like that. I again, again, they suit the club though, don't they? they suit yeah, the they're making it work. Yeah. It's, it's hard to have two proper yeah. number nine, proper goal scorers because teams don't really play with two up front anymore. But I think Newcastle are managing it quite well, Eddie Howe. I think he's been hmm. very clever with the way he's done it. Like, he'll have spells where Isak is played. He doesn't really go one for one. Like he doesn't rotate them week by week, but he gives them more spells. There was a six week mm. period last season, I think, where Wilson was playing, and at the moment we're in a six week period where Isak's playing and Wilson's been injured as well. So they're working it well. But Ollie Watkins is an unbelievable centre forward. Um, but honestly, unbelievable. And I will die on that hill. Well, I don't want to dig him out because he's my mate, but Dolan sometimes texts me and says, I think we need to upgrade forward. And I'll be like, no. <laughs> and this was, you know, to be fair to him, this was at the point where he hadn't just scored a hat trick or yeah, scored yeah. against Chelsea. And I, and I was still saying it then. I believe it that strongly because even when he's not in the goals, he's enabling the rest of the team to score. Think about how many Villa haven't scored three times under Unai Emery. Three mm. times in nearly a year, three games, we haven't scored it. Ollie Watkins has been on the pitch for pretty much all of those games, hasn't he? I don't remember him ever not starting a game. Under Emery in the league, so, in the I league. might be completely wrong here, but I can't, I can't think of a game where Watkins didn't play off the top of my head. So even when he's not scoring, which there has been times, especially at the start of this season, the team is, mm. and a lot of that is down to him as well. So yep. I will, I keep saying it, I will die on that hill that Villa can't get a better striker than Ollie Watkins. There isn't one. I saw your tweet when I put out the tweets for asking questions where you said you'd die on the hill uh, for something else uh, mm. about set pieces, and that came off the back of a question from. Uh, Stephen, should we be expecting more from our set pieces and set piece coach at the moment? Considering between Mustard and Wolves, we had 25 corners and didn't bother the scoreboard once. Feels like we should be making better use of these. Before I let you go off on your spiel and die on the hill, uh, I've got a, couple of, got a couple of numbers for you. Uh, so James Rushton flagged this from the optaanalyst.com. Uh, the scoring rate of corners is only 3 to 4%. 13.6% of goals in the Premier League across the last five seasons have been from corners. And from AVFC Stato, Aston Villa rank 13th in the Premier League this season for XG from set plays with a total of 2.32. Only six teams in the Premier League have more goals from set pieces than Villa. Villa have two. Everton have the most with five. Man City, Liverpool, Spurs, Newcastle, Arsenal have four. 
I looked at the numbers for the Mostar and Wolves and there was also the Chelsea game, I think, uh, where we had a lot of corners, more than I would suspect is the average. And I've not got anything in front of me. I've not got a way to say, you know, we've scored five goals in the last year from set pieces or whatever it would be. But I kind of, I understand the broader look that, well, we're having 30 corners. We should probably score one or two. And we probably should. But I don't think it's a massive kind of negative that we haven't because I think our set pieces have been creative at times and, and yeah. a little bit uh, a little bit kind of forward thinking and you're just unlucky that sometimes they don't come off so I've got a couple of things to say off the back of the stuff that you read out Take it away. so you reference Everton I think Man City they were mm. ahead of Villa look at the size of their teams Man City and Everton are have New, must Newcastle have five. in there as well. They're a big side. Spurs yeah, got they, some big players. Yeah, they play Dan Burn at left back. So you know Newcastle. Yeah. Are, they're teams that are good in good area. Have Villa got a squad that is good area? Probably not. Mings is the best in the air, and even he was not prolific from set pieces. Was he one goal last mm. season? You know, take Mings out of that team. It's not a big team. It's not a physically imposing team. It's not a team that's really really good in the air. Is it 30 corners across the two games? You can throw it off the European game straight away because that's just against a team that's just sat back, penned mm. in their own penalty area. You're going to get a lot of corners. They're going to have every man back. It's a frustrating night. It becomes you, kind of what you plan and stuff goes out the window in a game like that. So mm. you just you are basically just lugging the ball in the box, essentially at that point, just hoping for something to break to you because you need a goal. And we scored off a header, in fairness. Mm. Even though it wasn't from a set piece, we scored off a header. Wolves on Sunday... Yes, it didn't. The goal didn't come directly from the set piece, but it was from a breakdown from a set piece. Mm-hmm. That doesn't get recorded. But, I bet. I no, bet. We've, yeah, I bet we've scored a few goals off the mm. breakdown of of set pieces over over the last few years. Against Brighton a few weeks ago, we came up with a really really inventive set piece. It was brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We nearly scored. We did, but we didn't score. And I will never see that 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 again because it's been done. You can't do it again. So we try all these little routines, and if they don't quite come off. It's looked at as in your failure from set pieces. Villa don't concede loads of goals from corners. Even if they did, that's not down to the set piece coach. That's mm. down to the players who are not carrying out in, in instructions. It's too simple to look at it as in we've conceded X amount from set players. We've scored this amount from set players. Is Austin McPhee doing his job properly? Absolutely, he's doing his job properly. Villa look way more of a threat from corners and set pieces than they ever have in my lifetime. They're way more inventive. From mm. corners and set pieces than they ever have been in my lifetime. We're not. It was noticeable at the start of last season when McFay kind of had to take a back seat because of Gerrard, and that that did happen. We did look terrible from corners, like conceding. We looked awful. Like we're going to concede from every yeah. corner in that Bournemouth game and Everton game. The game after, mm. he goes. Emery comes in. McFay's given more control. We look better from set pieces again. First game when Gerrard got the boot and it was Danks and Cutler. McFay had come in and. Obviously, been able to take control of set pieces again. We scored off a, a really clever corner routine. Leon Bailey scored. Austin McPhee has been a really, really good appointment for Villa. Really, really good. And if you speak to anyone who works at the club or anyone who's around the club, everyone raves about him. It's too simplistic to look at we scored this amount of goals from corners, we conceded that amount of goals from corners to, to have someone down as a su- as a success. It's, it's like Ollie mm. Watkins again. If you miss his chances, does that mean he's had a good game or not? It's too simple to say his mischances is bad. It's the yeah. same with, with set pieces. Football is a complicated sport. You can look into so many different things, and most things come down to, to your eyes in the end. You can have all the statistics in your in, in the world. I don't want to put AVFC stats out of a job there. But, you know, you can have all the stats in the world. You know, football, I tend to look at what I'm seeing with my eyes, and Villa are so good from set pieces. They might not score every game from one, but that's never going to happen anyway, and you've read out the numbers, we're infinitely better from set pieces with Austin McPhee at the club. And like you say, he survived three regimes now. If he was no good, who know, Emery bins him off and gets him yeah. gets in his own man. It, it's, a, it's a, as reductive as the argument a few years ago when John Terry was here as defensive coach. Yeah, cool. he's, yeah he's exactly. a great, great defender, John one, Terry of, Dewey, one of the Premier League's best. Dewey. Yeah, if we can't defend with John Terry, what hope do we have? It's, it isn't as simple as that. Before we came on air, we were speaking about this one a little bit because I knew I was going to read off some numbers and whatnot. There's a couple of games this season. I, I don't know whether I've, it's just a recency bias thing that I don't remember it from last year. There's been occasions where we've had a, a free kick routine or a corner where there'll be like two clusters of, of Villa players like go off in separate directions on, on, on maybe the edge of the 18 yard box, two sides, maybe three players and three players. You generally see, and this is a massive over generalisation, a big cluster of players man marked whatever and a ball comes in they all move 
Villa splitting that and having two pockets of players instantly just made me kind of sit up and go, oh, we've got more options now. It probably is a new thing because set pieces have to be fluid. They have to be ever, ever changing. Yeah. You can't do the exact same thing you did on set pieces one week and then do it the next because teams have so many analytical staff and look at, they look at all these things. Mm. So from a game-to-game basis, what you do from set pieces has to com- completely change. I think you have your principles, especially defensively with what you do. So Villa generally defend defending corners. The big players, Carlos, Pau Torres, Conza, they aren't man-marking. They're in they're in they're mm. in zones. Watkins always has a zone as well. And it was interesting in the game on, on, on Sunday, like people where I was sat were like, Why's McGinn marking Dawson? Get Carlos on him. He's he's not marking Dawson. He's just being a disruptor. He's being a mm. he's being a blocker. Villa don't really do marking. He's there to cut to block and slow down runs. The principles of the defending set pieces are the three that are set across mm. the six yard box there villa's principles and not many teams do man marking it's not anything that happens in football really anymore at a high level and it, it must be because it's been proven that statistically you're better off having people defend zones and having the blockers cut off the the big men now Daw- dawson's a dangerous player from from, from set pieces but again did, did he score from a set piece at the weekend yep. did he even have a chance no so just because it looked awkward mcginn marking him what we did actually worked a hill successfully Died upon. I've died twice now on a hill, so that's good. Uh, let's move on. A nonsense one, why not? Uh, from Oscar, it says, "Debate this: Does pineapple belong on pizza or not?" No, no, no chance. Oh, I, don't I, even, yes. I, don't, I don't think I've even ever. I don't think I've even ever had it. Would I put an apple on pizza? No, no. Would I put strawberry? grapes? On, would I put grapes or strawberries on pizza? <laughs> no. I've got Italian family, so my background is my mum's. Mm. Oh, oh, Italian. Oh, then but, I said I thought you'd say yes. So there's absolutely no way you're going to say yes, and is there? Yeah, so, but when we go to Italy, and I haven't been for a while, in fairness, you know, they've got like this big, one of my, someone in my mom's family got this big farm, big, massive pizza oven outside. I don't know, mm. is it just called a pizza oven? Has it got a name? I don't know whether it's got a technical term. But they have the pizza, which you just know, margarita, pepperoni, whatever. And then they have, for dessert, it's pizza. Ah, uh, okay. I do right, like yeah, Nutella yeah. pizzas. In mm. that instance, I think it would be acceptable to whack a pineapple on mm. pizza. But you wouldn't have pasta and put pineapple on it. Well, there will be some instances and some some pushback on this from the comments, and I can't think off the top of my head where fruit is in a savoury dish. How good is, like, melted cheese? Oh, I'm enjoying a bit of melted cheese. Oh, I don't want a pineapple in there, a bit of pineapple in there, because that ruins it. Let's do another, not nonsense one, but uh, away from football on the pitch at least and, and digital football from Wurzel, or AVFC says, will there be any more football manager episodes and will you be letting Dan Bardell wreck your season again with these dodgy tactics? Fair play, Wurzel. You, you've called it spot on there with the, the dodgy tactics. I've explained um, this before that I am, football <laughs> manager is a huge part of my life. I doubt Many people be good football managers. Now listen, I don't think they. Many people enjoy football managers as much as I do. Like I talk, uh, me and you will quite often be on WhatsApp, but we'll be talking about football manager saves, and you know that's quite mm. sad. But I don't. I love yeah. it. Like I can't wait for the new one to come out. I haven't been playing the old one because I'm just waiting for the waiting for the new one to co- to come out now. I spend a lot of time and go into a lot of detail, setting things up, doing tactics, training for those shows. No one wants to see all that. So you don't let me do it. So we we might pick a team really. and pick a formation for a game, but I'm not allowed to do any of the other stuff that that goes with it. I'm not allowed to build an identity, build a football club. So people are saying about my dodgy tactics. I'm generally quite good at football manager, but I'm not given the time and the delicacy to do what I <laughs> what I want to do. It was nonsense what we were doing. I'd come in <laughs> and then that it was the it was the other guy Pat Pat. Pat yeah. Pat would have managed six games with you before before me. Nonsense. I'd come in, be picking up the paces and having to try and recover from like a six game losing run. Like let me have a whole season. Yeah. Let me have a whole season doing my thing. Yeah, that was the other thing. There was there's narr- things were based around narrative. You wanted to sign Gareth Bale because you thought it was good for you're like Stephen Gerrard bringing Coutinho in you. Uh, let's bring in <laughs> Gareth Bale. You didn't have you didn't care about the wage bill or the foundation of the club. You cared about entertainment for the Content. video. Let yeah, yeah. the con- let Part me come in and let me let me build from the ground up. We will we'll try and sort that out. I mean, as this video comes out, the the early release beta thing is probably on the horizon, isn't it? The full game comes out like November fifth or November sixth yeah. or something like that. So um it's possible that I the football manager series will be coming back. 
in the next couple of weeks, let's say. Right, let's move on to the last couple of questions, football-related ones, you'll be oh, pleased to know. There's two no, left. I don't the other stuff. I, um, you know, like, I talk about Villa all the time. I know, that's Ooh. what you're here for. That's, this is, oh, this is the show. To be fair, these are more almost like hypothetical, long-term uh, Aston Villa questions, so something to look ahead to. Uh, mm-hmm. We'll get a, a more current one out of the way first from Hidden Villain, who says, out of the following three players, who is most important to Aston Villa? Douglas Louise, Esri Konza, John McGinn. It's like Shag Marry Avoid, isn't it? This. <laughs> um, spat everywhere then. <laughs> I'm, uh, I've become ill on this podcast. I was only ill a few weeks ago, so I don't, I don't know what's going on. Who was it? McGinn, Louise, and Konza. Who is the most? I've got to put rank them in order. Who's it's the important. most important currently? Uh, you can pick just number one if you want. I think I'd have to say Konza yeah. because Mings isn't there. I like that stability and the continuity that, that that brings. I think he stepped up his game to take, not take on all, because I don't think he can, but he take on some of the stuff that, that Mings was doing. So let's say we lost Louise, then Tillemans probably comes in with a run of games. I think Tillemans would be do well. But I do, this is stupid because I think Louise is our best player at the moment. Mm. Outfielder, I would say Douglas Louise is our, is our best player. McGinn's very, very important. He's the captain. He's the, the heartbeat of the of, of the side. But out of the three of them, I think at the moment, because Mings is out as well, the one that we can do without the least is Konza. Oh, I, did, I was trying to make a case in my head for McGinn just because he's the least obvious answer. But I'm not sure whether I can over the other two because of the reasons you said Mings missing makes Konza more important. I think he probably plays every single game available this season. Yeah, well, he has. He's played um, every minute. He has so far, the yeah. Only I think I think he will at the end of the season, provided his body doesn't doesn't give out at some point, which I am concerned about. I agree with I you that Douglas right. Louise is probably our best footballer. I'd be slightly concerned about Tillemans coming in, but I also agree, given a run of games, I think he w- would be okay. But I still think that's quite a drop off between those two. And I love McGinn and more than I thought I probably would have done twelve months ago because I thought the Gerald era might have ruined him a little bit, and there was obviously all the kind of conversations about the captaincy choice and all those kind of things, and whether he would be the right fit long term. Uh, and that's proven that he has been, and he, he is very important to us, but not as important as those other two. I don't think. I think it's an interesting three that were, that were picked because if you're asking me who Villa's three most important players are at the moment, I would look at it from the perspective of Martinez. Oh, two different ones, yeah, yeah, Martinez because. The person that comes in for him is nowhere near as good as him, mm. being brutal, and he's the best goalkeeper in the world, in my opinion. So he can't be replaced within the squad by anyone. Watkins, I think he offers so much for you know we've done a podcast on Watkins essentially already, and then probably concert at the moment because Mings Mings is out. But if Mings was fit as well, mm. I'd probably have a different number three. I'd probably would then say maybe Louise because I do think we're an infinitely better team with Douglas Louise. In midfield, I think he makes us tick. I think when he wasn't there in the first half in the European game, we weren't very good. And then he was a big reason why we were better in the yeah. second half, just because he does all the, the things that you'd want a number six to do. So yeah, I thought the three that were we were given as option was was quite interesting. Mm. Me and Alex Berwick did the Villa Ladder probably a month or so ago now. It was in the last well, international the break, actually. Um, like ranking the players based on importance to Emery. And I think my top three was Martinez, Watkins. I possibly put McGinn over Louise just because he was captain. But it was a very like slim pick in between those two as being third placed important. I didn't even yeah. have concerts as high as I probably should have given um, the, the absence to Mings. But he'd certainly be right up there as well. But I don't think we can play the way we want to without Martinez and Watkins. So they have to be. Oh, I'll obviously, well, Louise, probably. So they're probably yeah. the, they're probably the three, aren't they? Final question then. This is one for the long term. Uh, this I think Ricardo's had two. Yeah, he had the one about Man United and Chelsea players earlier on, so that doesn't really count. So Ricardo again. If Unai Emery is still at Aston Villa in three or four years' time, what realistically will we have achieved in that period? I think we'll have won something. Whether it be a Conference League, whether it be an FA Cup, I think we will have won something. And I think we'll not necessarily be a team that finishes top five every season, but we'll be amongst it, challenging mm. for the top five every season. That would be where I envisage us being. And I'd be very, very happy with that. Obviously, uh, I'm, you know, you're talking three or four seasons here and multiple transfer windows to, to change things. Do you think Villa could be that side that are like, become part of that? You know, when people talk about a big six or whatever, I don't do you think, think Villa could anymore. consistency? No, but like, it will exist whether we with no, whether we like it, it or not. I don't think it will. Can Villa consistently always do that though? Football can change very quickly. Like Tottenham were rubbish last season and now the top of the league. True. So but that doesn't mean they'll be top you know, around the top for the next Chelsea three or four years consistently. Consistently top three for years. 
now they look miles off it. Mm. Like the cyclical football, Gary Neville always says that football is cyclical and it changes. But you, you know, the top seven, eight is usually you get the same kind of teams around. The Newcastle have changed things a bit, but I do think Villa and Brighton have changed things mm. as well with the way they've operated as as football clubs as as well. You might have a season where you finish fourth and then have a season the next season where you finish eighth and it's not so good, but I would back us to consistently be challenging around the top four or five and mm. have to have won something. Man City will always be top top two, top three, I would I, I would think. You know, Arsenal were rubbish a few years ago and now they're everyone's sure, saying they're yeah. the next best team after Man City. So it, do, it does change, but it is fluid. But I do think you might, like I say, you might have a season where you finish eighth or ninth, but you win a cup. And then the next season, you don't win a cup and you're challenging towards the top four or five. I, I think Villa will always be somewhere around that as long as Emery's the manager because I think he's that good. Yeah, and I would, like you, absolutely take that. How many trophies, let's say four seasons, that are taking up to be in here for five years total? How many trophies? Obviously, he's not won anything in his first year. So if Emery has five years at Aston Villa, how many trophies could he have won during that time? I'll just say, as long as he wins one, I don't care. I just want to just want to win something. And sometimes, you know, winning one trophy brings the, the next one. It's mm. that first one that's always the most difficult. Yeah. It's the hardest one to do. You know, we've come so close on a on a number of occasions, getting to finals and not got over the over the line. It, I just want one trophy. Just give me a trophy. I haven't seen a trophy since I was 10. That's a joke. I mean, we talk about the next three or four years. I think Villa could win a trophy within the next 12 months. I think we could have, we've got yeah. every chance of winning the Conference League. So that'll be trophy number one. And then if Villa do do, as you say, and get up around the top five consistently over the next three or four seasons, I would expect another trophy during that time in addition to the Conference League, which makes me sound totally greedy considering we've not won anything for 27, 28 you years. You've never seen us win anything. I was I was about six months old when we won that 96 final. Dan, thanks for joining me as always. It's been a pleasure to pleasure. chat through and some good questions uh, from viewers as well. We'll be back uh, on Thursday for another show. Me and Matt have done a like building a, a squad game thing that will be out on Thursday and we'll be back on Friday. <laughs> You've proper sold that. That sounds like a <laughs> riveting video, a building right. squad builder thing. <laughs> So a few months ago, we did like the best Premier League Villa 11, like in the Premier League era. But because the same names come up, don't they? McGrath, yeah. Ian Taylor, blah, blah, blah. So we did the same builder thing of making an 11, mm-hmm. but we had to use 11 different nationalities to give it some Ooh, variation to talk about different players. That's good. And we did it We did it like a draft. So if I pick somebody, Matt couldn't have him in his. So it was 22 different players across the two sides. That sounds better. You, okay, you, thank you. You, need, you, need, you needed to needed to explain. I had to. I did like it. There's a podcast that goes around and speaks to various people, and they pick their best eleven from the team that they support. Mm. I did one recently on a on, on Villa, and I had to make a change to my eleven for the first time in years. Why? I will only put someone in my best ever Villa eleven when they've left. Right. Okay. Really, obviously left, and I felt like he had to be in there, so I had to take someone out of my yeah, best okay. eleven, which was which was upsetting. Petro, I've had to make why. Do you want to hear my best 11? Go on, then. While, while we're here, we might as well, I suppose. We do it? Can I guess it first? And then I'm, yeah, go on. Then. I'll tell you, it's like a, it's basically Emery's formation because the two wide players basically come in and make a box. Okay. So is this players you've seen as well? Yeah, I've only, oh yeah, I've seen all of them. And they've all, there's no current players in there? No. Bosnich and goal? Yep. Melberg right back? Yep. McGrath? Yeah. Has to be in there? Yeah. Larson? Yeah. Is it a left back, a proper left back? Yep. You Adam won't see him fly. Yeah, Adam Wright. And then the two Ian sitters. Tyler, the yeah, that. Tyler's always in there. Yeah. Captain Bobler. Two sitters. Gareth Barrett? Yep, Gareth Barrett. Grealish, obviously, on the one side. Yep. Paul Merson? Yeah. Oh, have you done this? Two strikes for either. Yeah. Ben Tecker? Yeah. Yeah, well, that's the end of the predict- podcast then. Thanks a lot. Predictable. Absolutely. That was good, wasn't it? Was this is exactly what I mean, though. You get the same names crop up. It's very easy to pick up. Some first, people though, would be like, Alan Wright, left back, because they. Again, another hill I would yeah. die on. Alan Rob's class. If you want more Best Eleven content, you can tune in on Thursday to the excellently, uh, excellently sold podcast that I described earlier. Uh, and we'll be back on Friday for a preview for the West Ham game, of course, as well. Uh, Premier League football will be back, and so will Aston Villa. Give this international nonsense. Uh, Dan, thanks for joining me as always. Um, we'll see you again very soon. Thanks, Dan.